It's like Ode to Joy? That's cool. Dang, it's Ode to Joy, but like grand orchestral sways of music and funk. How's it going, guys? And welcome to Pal. <laughs> I want to make sure. Oh, I'm gonna try to say it right. Pal Palinurus. Palinurus, I'm guessing. Um, now this is gonna be an interesting one. Uh, I'm doing a quick experiment. I've been a little. I don't know. I've been wanting to reach it a little bit more, make more content. And my Fridays have been kind of a grab bag of like, oh, something fun I want to do. But I feel like I don't really have enough randomness to really fill all my weekends. And you've kind of seen that in the past couple months. It's just. There's only so much I can really do without feeling like I'm stretching for, like, content, and that doesn't feel right. I want to be making content I really enjoy and I really think you'll enjoy. So, uh, this will be a quick experiment to see if I can handle doing three visual novels a week. You know, one for Monday, Wednesday, Friday, with uh, Letters from the Cosmere or maybe an odd you know, quiz or something fun I want to do that's on the side. Maybe coming out on a Saturday or just whenever I feel like it's ready to be published. Um, just because I feel like I have the time. And I want to make sure I, I make enough content, but we'll see. We'll, we'll see if this will happen. It's got to really work with my family schedule, too. So if this doesn't work out, that's why I'm starting with something smaller. But this is Palinaris. Now, this was written for a 2015 NaNoWriMo, which is a challenge that people can set to write a 50,000-word uh, book or story in the month of November, just to, to push people to achieve goals in writing, because that's the hardest part of writing, is actually sitting down and making sure you finish a project. Uh, so this apparently was put together, and then the people enjoyed it enough that they got a team of volunteers from around the around the globe, and they all kind of worked together to, to make this. And this is actually a redo of the original version that I guess was just very basic. Um, they put new sprites, it's more kinetic now, um, it's got some nice music, which you may have heard at the beginning, that was a little, doing some jigs too, oh, to joyish. Um, but, and, on, and the main story here is going to be, it's a, it's a guy traveling on a starship, with an AI that's built into the computer to help make the travel to Alpha Centauri more bearable, but something something happens, and uh, they're gonna have to deal with some of the stresses of this trip. And apparently, we get to learn about uh, the characters. So this isn't gonna be a choice one, and it's gonna be pretty short, as far as I, I understand. But apparently, it's pretty good. And I, when I was doing my research and looking for visual novels and trying to keep an eye out for something I think will 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 enjoy, this caught my eye, and I was like, okay, we gotta do it. And it's free to play on Steam, so if you like what you see uh, at the beginning, you can just hop onto Steam, download it, watch it, and play it yourself, and then you can come back and watch me react to it and kind of see what, what I pull from the story. I mean, I love it when we can do stuff like that. Um, and also, just keep an eye on the, on the group, because I guess the people who enjoy this so much, they're actually going to start trying to make other games in the future. So, I think they're called Watercrest, so keep an eye out for them. Anyway, I digress, and Watercrest, if you're listening to this, by the way, I look forward to playing your game, and hopefully you enjoy uh, my interpretation and my uh, rundown to the game. I love being able to find people who are starting out new projects. I mean, Ace Academy is a great example of one that is right out of the gate, amazing game. And it's the first one of the of that company's too. So let's get started with this one. Let's see. Pelinaris. Okay, there's the stuff over the side. Oh, the story of the ocean of stars. Oh, beautiful. Joy, beautiful sparkling of the gods. Daughter of Elysium. Elysium, that's a common sci-fi term. They use that in a lot. Okay. Marable Station spiraled ceaselessly in an otherwise unremarkable corner of deep space. <laughs> There's nothing unremarkable about space unless you get to live there, I'm sure. It's like, oh look, more stars. Just the best views you could ever imagine. I want to be in space so bad. I was waiting for my flight number to be called. I tapped a finger against my knee, eager to be on my way. I'd rehearsed this ritual countless times before. Maribel Station was hardly remarkable. As far as space stations went, though then again, who was to say that there were many tru truly remarkable space stations in the first place? Me? I'd love to go. Surely there were hundreds of millions of travelers passing in droves through the Andromeda Central Station. Dang. Andromeda was the work of art, and performers, painters, composers would all gather in the artificially terraformed central plaza to find an audience. 
It was a mosaic of colors, sights, sounds, a brazen horde of the intergalactic human culture, like a Venice atop the sea of stars. Wow, very colorful, beautiful language being used here. And I was stuck here in the gray factory produced pit stop, waiting for my lonesome, uh, waiting by my lonesome for my flight's preparations to finish up. Okay, maybe that would be kind of dull. For as long as I could remember, space travel out in the boonies, uh, yeah, on the boonies was like this lonely, tedious, cramped, time consuming, stripped to the status of a commute that would never seem to end. So it's kind of like intergalactic truck travel. Space travel as an enterprise was far too expensive, far too dangerous for allowing anything short of a mega corporation to handle the logistics. I glanced in at my ticket. Sure enough, there it was. Titan Transportation Solutions in loud, bold, bleak font. It was one of the bigger. It was one of the bigger players in the field, and they were the ones that footed the bill for I don't know thousands of space stations just like this one. Man, the money they must be wielding. Good grief. And let's be perfectly clear here. Space is big. Enormous. <laughs> Try to wrap your head around how infinitely spread out, how empty it all really is. You can't. Like, for instance, light, I believe, takes, what is it, over 500,000, like, years to travel from one end of the, is that, is that even right? No, it's gotta be millions, like 500 million years to travel across just our galaxy. And our galaxy is not even, like, observable from some of the even some similar closer points of like our galactic cluster like if you were to pull back out there theoretically we wouldn't be almost invisible because our galaxy is dimmer than a lot of other ones it's just absolutely mind-boggling how big it is to get anywhere of consequence in space one must leapfrog through dozens upon dozens of space stations like these scattered throughout the galaxy i had been doing precisely that for the better part of old earth month so rest assured, I was well rehearsed. I knew my lines, I could nail down the song and dance in my sleep. And if the day space gets monotonous will be a sad day. <laughs> I was, at any rate, getting restless. There isn't a lot to see in space, just tons of tiny, identical white dots, and plenty of tiny gray checkpoints to pass through. But that was the price you had to pay to get anywhere. And sometimes, if you are lucky, you get the occasional nebula, or debris cloud, or band of pirates. Oh yeah, that would be exciting. Yo ho ho, please don't eject me out the airlock. I focused my attention on the silver spaceship which lay before me. I'd seen many like it before. It was small, and intended for a single occupant. From the outside, it looked relatively unremarkable. It was sleek, like an arrow. The cockpit stood out. The windshield wrapped itself around the front of the vessel, stopping just as the ship's nose began to flow downward into its underbelly. Okay, so at least that's a good view. Its exterior was sleek. <laughs> its exterior was sleek. Like the curved wings wide, like curving wings wide like that of an albatross. Attention, attention, Mirabel Station. The intercom crackled. We are now boarding one man shuttle flight 393094B. Shuttle flight 93094B. Passenger of flight 93094B. Please secure your belongings and board immediately. That's gotta be us. Finally, that was just the notice I've been waiting for. My flight was prepped and ready. It's hard to see a semicolon actually used in context. Nice. I hurried down the main uh, concourse of the hangar bay, checked to make sure the shuttle was marked with my flight number, and slipped inside. The cabin interior betrayed its sleek exterior. Lights along the walls and ceiling illuminated the passage. Their luminance rippled towards the cockpit. The floor was lined with dark, navy blue carpets that traveled up the walls for a few inches. Ooh, nice. It's kind of hard to see, but... I made my way towards the cockpit, taking a look around. A cursory glance revealed two seats, confirming the hunch that this was a repurposed vessel. I remember that. Back in the day, every spaceship required human pilots and co-pilots. I guess this was a relic from the old regime. There wasn't much room to move around in the cockpit. A word of buttons, dials, flashing lights, and other mechanisms were scattered around the control console. On the bright side, you have extra space, but that's a lonely trip. <laughs> The cockpit was dominated by the enormous windshield that opened up to the command, uh, opened up to a com commanding view of, well, at the moment, precisely nothing. Nothing but space and a notion of stars. It was hard to get excited from such a sight anymore. Oh, how jaded. Within moments, the cockpit was bathed in warm blue light, and the computerized voice began to speak. New passenger detected. 
Initiating uh, resignation sequence. Ugh, slotted that one. I held up my ticket between two fingers, just to make sure the system registered it. The blue light shifted around a small area and then dissipated su suddenly. Passenger identification ticket code number 0992403. Transit authorized. Spooling intelligent navigational kernel. Analyzing an anima complex, unlocking communication synthesis codex. That's a lot of technical sci-fi babble. Quantum processors are online. Database re uh, registries. Uh, <laughs> database registries are online. Analytical engines are online. Actualization key is online. Registration hex sequence and iconic bulkheads. Checking firmware for updates. One, two. Firmware is currently up to date. It's like starting on uh, like a PC. It's like all the checkpoints you got to go through. Checking saint. Uh, checking sentient limitation codex. One, two. Unit Awakening Authorized. Intelligence Navigator Persona Unlocked. Navigator 21109 CBP. Copyright Inclassited Intergalactic Transportation. Year 2520. Unit Name Intelligent Navigator Budapest. Okay. So I think that's, uh, that's the AI we'll be working with. Then suddenly the voice became softer, more polite, more feminine. Initializing. One moment, please. Slowly it became more and more human. <laughs> How do you say that? I heard something click above my head and glanced up to notice a small metal compartment extruding a, a multitude of lenses like the most intensive camera in the cosmos. So that's where it was. Inside it, some mechanisms whirled to life and the lenses began to twist, oscillating to extend. They focused on a single point, the pilot seat to the left. Aww, she's cute. Slowly, a human figure co coalesced. Its form was translucent, accompanied by a dress of white as ivory. For a second, it seemed that she had caught fire, as brilliant red hair flowed from her head down to the back of her shoulders. Delicate, feminine features emerged as one. Ears, a nose, the eyes, and a mouth curled into a polite, natural, neutral grin. The two long, slender arms trailed into two smaller and slender hands, clasping each other in front of a flowing dress. The projection's eyes opened, revealing irises of striking sapphire. They looked like planets, glowing against the backdrop of deep space. Well, when you can design- it's like anime, it's like, when you can design how someone looks, of course you can make them absolutely gorgeous. It took all the appearance of a woman, but I recognized the emulation at work. This would be the personal navigator assigned to the shuttle, an artificial intelligence designed to serve humanity. Greetings, passenger sir. Are you doing well today? Uh, yeah, yes. I'm doing fine, thank you. I took a second to ease into my seat, cycling over all the belts and harnesses which draped my heart suit. Time to head out again, I suppose. Space travel certainly doesn't get exhausting after a while. But, oh well, at least the navigator seems nice this time. AIs have become a fixture of space travel by this point. Before, you needed two pilots and at least two to operate a vessel like this. Two pilots at least operate a vessel like this. But programs didn't need food or water, and they certainly didn't ask for rum rumination. It was a convenient cost-cutting measure to the Megacorps, and the switch was welcomed by customers with open arms. I am glad that you are feeling well. I am the Intelligence Navigator Budapest, and I will be accompanying you on this voyage. Now, let's take a look at your registration. The Navigator turned his back to me, bringing up the... And Electrical and uh, electronic windows of records and data like it was conjuring magic barriers. It was like uh, people love AI for stuff like this. Yeah, that's cool. Like all sci-fi and like look like a Iron Man's house. They bought all the they brought all the efficiency of a personal planner, calculator, and computer, all stuffed into a pretty looking package with flair and style. By all the sketches of the imagination, they were wonderful workers. They worked tirelessly. They were quick thinkers, and you could customize anything about them to meet your own needs. It seemed this navigator was left with its default settings, though, just as well. I didn't plan to see much of it from the cabin. The pilot seat had been retooled to fit this holographic generator, so it wasn't much use here anyway. Departing from Maribel Station at 0400, Imperial Standard Time. Imperial? Mm -hmm. Destination? Galactic Grand Central Station in the Alpha Centauri system. Hmm, this is going to be quite a lengthy journey, isn't it? Not to worry, passenger sir. You have my word. I'll get you to the Grand Central safe and sound. Aww. 
Uh-uh. Don't say it like that. <laughs> Some people ended up getting too a attached to their AI. Personally, I tend to keep my distance. At the end of the day, they were basically programs. Lines of code assembled to execute tasks behind artificial visages of a living person. Okay, hang on though. If it's true AI, like our definition of true AI, like a program that can grow and develop and adapt its own programming, like effectively evolving, that really is constituting life in my opinion. I don't know. It's hard, it's hard to really pin down like where does life actually start at that point, but I, I essentially think that like the instant they have that ability, especially if they can react with um, awe, wonder, questions, anger, sad, depression, like when they can start having those emotions or start doing things that aren't in their base programming, like they keep adding things to their own programming, we need to be really careful how we treat them. Because there really isn't much of a difference. I mean, we're electrical signals working around in a biological computer. An AI would be replicating that exact same thing that makes us us. But I digress. Whatever niceties they uttered, whatever niceties they uttered, came from the mouth of some programmer or some psychologic psycholog psychologist in a clinic, or at least from a dialogue construction engine designed by such. Content to confirm my presence and leaving the pilot to the navigator, I nod in affirmation. I'll be launching from the station now. Please remain seated and harnessed until the in in instructed otherwise. Roger that. Loud and clear. <laughs> I took a few paces to my seat in the cabin, not too far from the personal navigator stationed in the cockpit. I lowered myself into the chair. It was surprisingly plushy. Aw, that'd be nice. I'd be like, oh, thank goodness, I won't have to rush my rump on this one. As usual, I threaded my arms through the safety harness and then clicked the connectors together. Leaning back, I turned my head to look out the window to my right. I heard an electrical sputtering and whirring from the shuttle disengaging from the hangar restraints. My stomach twisted with anticipation, and suddenly, the shuttle lurches forward. After a few moments of throttle, we reach open space and cruise our way out of the station. And it appears we are off. Currently at cruising speed of 40,000 kilometers per hour, pilot navigational route now. Calculating estimated arrival time. Mm. So, passenger sir, do you travel often? Yes, very. But never with a navigator as amiable as yours truly, I assume. Aw, that's cute. I laugh. <laughs> that's pretty clever. For a navigator, you come up with that or your programmers. That line's one of my own. Thank you very much. One of your own? Which you thought of using your processors to comp- to, uh, Which you thought up using the processors your company built for you? Hmm. Teasing your navigators against regulations, you know? Ought to have you reported. Oh dear, I do apologize. Alright, she's already reminding me of Syl from Way of Kings. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna like Budapest a lot. I thought you said you weren't a novice to travel. I'm not. You seem like a greenhorn to me. Which of the other navigators have you even met? Hmm, collected survey data from the company. I see. Ah, uh, don't underestimate me, navigator. I wasn't joking around about how much I've traveled. Let's see, there was... Vienna... Warsaw, Chicago, Osaka, Chiang Mai. I get it, I get it. You've had your way through a bountiful cast of artificial intelligences. You make it sound so incident. Uh, you make it sound so indecent when you put it like that. Oh, is that so, passenger sir? Interesting. <laughs> I give a small, polite chuckle out of respect, though it's not as if I was particularly ob obligated to show such s social uh, courtesy to a machine. It was just a peculiar personal habit of mine, which I'd obtained from spending so much time in transit. I mean, you got nothing better to do. If you don't mind me asking... Hmm? What'll you be doing once we arrive in Office Centauri? It'd better be something worthwhile, after I have such a long trip. Is this how you screen for potential troublemakers? I wasn't planning anything shady now. The navigator lets out a short, pre-programmed giggle. <laughs> Goodness, no. Just curious is all. I ask the same questions of all my passengers. Just curious? The navigator is just curious? Something of a tradition I have. Hmm? A tradition it has. No kidding. I shrug. Sightseeing, mostly. Maybe I'll try my luck down at ACB, too. Oh, 
Ah, the planet? It must be unbearably hot at this point of its orbit. Oh, it's unbearably hot all the time. It's like walking to the core of a smelting plant. <laughs> true, true. Any business down there? Man, that's this is crazy conversation. Ah, uh, corporate espionage, is it now? No, sir. I assure you, none of these questions were pre-programmed. I'm going to be piloting shuttles from my time eternal. If you haven't noticed, you could afford me a little courtesy about my passengers. Ugh. It's mostly morbid curiosity, maybe, that's pulling me down there. Maybe I'll scoop out some mining prospects in the area. They say they found platinum down there. I could use it, afford a square meal. More likely, I'll end up digging some nickel and iron, but that'd be fine with me. Shoot for the moon and you land amongst the stars, or something like that. Oh, that for a meal? Pardon me for saying so, passenger sir, but that sounds a little reckless. Might be. Me? I'm not bothered by it. It's hard to scrape up credits in this economy. Besides, it's bound to be pretty view. And who knows, maybe some other lunatics have the same idea I did. Sounds like a wonderful adventure. <laughs> You're quite the character, sir. I'll be roosting I'll be rooting for you to hit it big. Thank you kindly for the well wishes. She's so nice, she's so sweet. Came from an AI, I didn't think much of it. But it was nice to hear aloud all, all, all the same. You're quite welcome. Now, we'll be serving our complimentary drink and beverages momentarily. Ah, oh, that's great. I had to skip breakfast. The navigator smiled. After the meal, I went ahead. After the meal, I went ahead and took a short nap. Snuggled into the ca cabin chair, I slept lightly. But well, I didn't dream of anything. But I didn't want to either. After some time of sleep, however, I was awakened with a start. Sir, passenger, sir, please come to the cockpit. I bolt upright, startled. Something must have gone wrong. Something seems to have uh, gone wrong. Uh, that took my cue and rushed over. Uh oh. As I strap into the cockpit, warning lights and alerts begin to blare, bathing the cockpit in a frantic kaleidoscope of colors. So so helpful. Like, yes, I understand there's a crisis going on, but why do you have to make it so hard for me to see what's happening? The navigator is set to work. Uh oh. Oh. How interesting. What? What is it? Did something happen? Hmm. Not to cause you any alarm, passenger, sir, but there's been an incident. Oh, great. That's a, those are great words, Houston. We have a problem. The shuttle's short-range radar has detected an incoming debris storm. That doesn't sound good. Actually, in fact, that's a very bad thing, isn't it? Well, I wouldn't say very bad, but you might want to. Now, like I said, there's no cause for alarm or anything. Of course not. But you might want to brace for impact. Oh, oh, oh dear. A, a, a debris storm? Oh, fetch. I hurry back to my seat in the cabin and look out the window, squinting my eyes. I see through the blackness of space. I can make out a few sparkling lights. Reflections? Yeah, reflections. The ship itself had bright, powerful lights attached to its wings, tail, and under the cockpit, and every time they flashed I got a peek of some sort of approaching mass. Oh boy. Meteoroids. Hundreds, maybe thousands of meteoroids drifting aimlessly through space, clustered together in a school. It'd be rare, but definitely... Well, rare is it because it's so vast, but I mean, stuff like this has got to be out there. A relentless, soaring landslide of steel on a direct collision course with the shuttle. Oh boy. My heart sank deep down in my stomach. Actually, no. It went past that. Plummeted straight down to my bowels. No cars for alarm, alright? I've, I've got it under control. No cars for alarm. No cause for alarm. If we just keep saying it, we'll believe it, right? <laughs> I repeated those words to myself, more incredulously each time. No cause for alarm. No cause for alarm. No cause for alarm. No cause for alarm. I took a deep breath, stealing myself for what I feared was coming. Still as a statue, I close my eyes, content not to watch it go down. I'm the opposite. Like, any time unpleasant thing's happening, like an IV in the arm, a shot from a doctor, you know, anything, I have to watch. Oh, that's not good. Tap, 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 tap. No, 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 no. I don't want to quit. I accidentally hit the X button. I can hear the sound of particles impacting the hull, the constant whine of ringing metal. They started sparse, spread out. Tap, 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 tap! Only a few minutes ago, the cabin had been eerily silent, and now a constant stream of sound filled it, like we'd flown into the midst of a typhoon. I could imagine the cold wind hitting my face, the fury of old earth. 
I think it was better coping mechanism. I'd rather be lost in a thunderstorm on a terrestrial surface than weathering a debris storm in a dingy old shuttle in one of the most remote parts of charted space. Oh, fetch, man. I winced, popping an eye open. A heavier rock pounded against the hull, and the ship lurched to one side. It didn't seem like we'd sustained any serious damage yet, so I sat there, clenching my legs, wringing my hands in desperation, hoping the storm would soon pass. Oh, wham, wham! Like, like fists driven by fury and rage, the meteorites continued to pan against the shuttle. With each impact, the rock dug into the hole, denting it and pushing against the cabin walls. The floor pressed against my legs, and large divots was suddenly formed. Ah, it was too close for comfort. Oh, this is like a, this is a nightmare. This is the absolute worst thing that could happen. Another larger meteorite ricocheted out the window. I was seated next to. I flinched and writhed in my seat. Look, I've been through worse than this before, alright? Way, way worse than this. I'm a veteran of this trade. An unsung hero of the artificial intelligence community, you know? This is nothing that I can't handle, so... Uh... Oh, that's bad. They came into sight. I saw enormous meteoroids, the heavy hitters of the storm, hurling themselves directly in our path. Even the awe-inspiring holy light of the distant stars cowered in the shadows of these meteoroids. It was on, I, one was on a due course for the cabin. It was a monstrous gray jagged mass that glint, glistened devilishly, its iron deposits reflecting the flashing emergency lights of our ship. It was going to impact, and it was going to impact very soon. I swallowed hard, lowered my hands into my harness. My hands shook thunderously. I couldn't get the switches and belts. Come on, barrel roll! Do something! Can't we navigate a little bit? I tugged at the straps, but they only seemed to be tight to tighten. Come on, come on, gosh darn it! Before all the strength had been drained from my arms, the belts miraculously disengaged. Passenger, sir, you need to get into the cockpit. It's the most isolated part of the ship, and we can seal it if the worst comes to worse. Oh, d oh dear. You need to get here now! I exhaled deeply and darted towards the cockpit. CRASH! Shrapnel and sparks flew everywhere, lighting up the world in a blaze of yellow and orange. The entire cabin swayed and shook as the horrendous sound of metal feet rending apart filled my ears. I slammed into the cockpit door, opening it and letting myself through, and then kicking it shut. Scrambling over to the console, I seal the cockpit door and engage all the airlocks. My breathing was frantic, my vision blurred. I was in a panic when I saw a pale figure of the navigator scrolling through monitors and screens and spreadsheets. It comforted me, at least a little bit. That one was especially bad. Damage report. The hull's been breached. You're lucky you got out of there in time, sir. It took some time to settle in, trying to find my footing in the cockpit and shuttle rumbling in the midst of the storm. I paused. I felt an odd sensation when my hands were resting on the windscreen. I drift my eye drifted my eyes down to take a look. A hairline fracture along the window pane. My finger ran along the thin, narrow line formed in the ultra-hardened glass. The splintered patterns it formed were remarkable, but I was paralyzed with terror. Suddenly another lurch forms, another large collision. Ah, dang it! Please, sir, take the cockpit seat and strap in. It's dangerous to remain standing at this time. Repetitive, re receptive to the machine's goading, I staggered to my feet, watching my footing and the lopsided cockpit. Eventually, I sank into the plushy co-pilot's seat in the navigator's right. I glanced over to her. Hey, navigator. Quick question. How in the heck did you not notice a massive meteorite right for us? They didn't show up in the short-range radar. Their iron compound deposits absorbed the signals. It's what I'm thinking. The storm came in too fast to be traced. I paused. So there was nothing that we could have done about it? The storm had just been drifting through space and just had decided to ravage us into its wake? What the heck kind of freak accident? Are you alright, passenger sir? Are you hurt? That was a nasty beating you took. The program looked so concerned so concerned for me. Still rubbing my forehead, I, wa I waved his concerns off, groaning to myself. Yeah, I had to be fine. Nothing I can't handle. What are we going to do now? Well, our vessel sustained critical damage. We've been knocked considerably off course. Both the navigational and communication systems are completely offline, and I haven't been able to find a way to repair them. But for now, we need to do something about the damage. Right now, the rest of the ship is nothing but sheared, hulking mass. Eight, 
Aiding unnecessary weight. Adding unnecessary weight. Preparations for testing the cockpit are underway. We should be far removed from the storm in due time. Understood. Proceed as you should, navigator. This ship's about to get a lot smaller. <sighs> Wait, what? Jettisoning the cockpit? The transit shuttle is an older model, sir. Previously designed for two human pilots. In the case of emergency, the shipmaker installed a simple mechanism to eject the cockpit, which contains a laboratory and necessary supplies for emergency survival. It was essentially a primitive form of an escape pod. Except roomier, and that's reliable. <laughs> okay, great! <laughs> Although I believe the jettison system of this craft is still working order, I do maintain it, after all. What? Well, when I thought about it, it wasn't such a strange thing to phrase out. Now the pilots were almost always navigators. Even then, I was glad it wasn't phased out entirely. The age of the ship may, ve may ve very well have been what saved me at the mo in this moment. Okay, well, that sounds doable. When are we going to be performing the jettison exactly? Hmm, no. <laughs> hey, don't climb up on me now. It's, it's not a sure thing, but I have to inspect our subsystems and see if they're still in working order. I thought you said it was still in working order. It is. Probably. Oh. The machine lied to me? Probably. It doesn't really. I'm going to need to inspect the circuitry in order to fire up the launch mechanism. This system was hardwired in, before the time of Navigator, so it hasn't been reconstructed in software like most everything else has. The AI turned to me, an apprehensive look in her soft eyes. It's, uh, pretty scary down there, so... Watch out for me, passenger, sir. Doesn't sound particularly confident right now. The program bowed stiffly with a weak smile. That sinking feeling in my gut stirred again. Hey, don't talk like that! You're a personal, nav personal navigator, aren't you? The AI's eyes drifted up to mine, wide like a child speaking at the scolding parent. For whatever reason, I couldn't bring myself to match her gaze. I looked off to the side. Er, I mean, do your best down there. I'm, I'm counting on you? The program stared back at me for a few painful moments, as if figuring something out in its mind. Its eyes were piercing, serious. In, in time, its eyebrows furrowed, its fierce looks bursting into its irises. Understood. I'm going in. Make sure your harness is correctly secured and I'll be back soon. I nodded. Click. That was the fastest I'd ever fastened my seatbelt straps. As the AI's holographic display switched off in a flash of white light, its camera retracted back into the inner workings of the console. In that moment, I was left to my own devices in the face of death. The cockpit was closed room, a frame of steel and dura glass, the only thing separating the pilots from the harsh, hellish vacuum of space. I looked out to the infinite expanse before me. The distant flickering stars. Boo. I felt the ship rumble with impact of another massive meteoroid. I shivered. Was I going to die here? Alone? In the infinite vastness of space? No one would care. No one would ever find me. Maybe I'd end up drifting out here forever. That scared me more than anything else. Heck yeah. Uh... I felt my seat vibrate. My hands felt instinctively the clasp of the armrests, attempting to keep myself steady. Ah! The entire room was shaking. It felt like the harnesses were about to rip apart. Chunk! Oh crap! And then, like a rag doll, I was flung back into my seat, sinking further and further into the Sith leather. I couldn't move my head. The pressure was too forceful. I simply started out the stared out started out the front cockpit as I saw it shoot forwards. We definitely just been jettisoned. The cockpit is. Small pebbles pelted the windscreen, but I didn't care. It was ecstatic, laughing to myself with giddy joy. The way was clearing up. The program managed it. We were going to make it. We we were about to hit another enormous meteoroid. Slam! A cockpit hurtled through space, spinning erratically from the scra scrape of the meteoroid. I clutched to my seat for dear life, feeling the G-forces press me into my seat. A cockpit once again draped in flashing lights and infographic displays was instantly shrouded in a suffocating curtain of darkness. The only light caught in the chaotic glimpses of the stars through the windscreen. I winced as the seat straps dug into my chest, the only thing keeping me from the hard collision with the windshield. I felt nauseous, the might of the centrifugal forces crushing the bare air from my lungs. Centrifugal, sorry, I said it wrong. Centrifugal forces. I strained to look up from my side, where the navigator had previously been, furiously pecking away at the interfaces to salvage our wreck in the transit shuttle. 
The logical part of me understood what it was up to, operating inside circuitry and wiring, but I still felt a wave of dread overcome me. What if it didn't work? What if the navigator failed? What if it didn't manage to restore power, or there was another breach in the hull? I'd have come, become trapped in the deepest, emptiest expanse mankind had ever known. I was trapped. Good as dead. And this was my grave. A coffin of glass and sparkling circuitry. It would have preserved my final moments. The dying expression on my face as I suffocated and froze in the vacuum of space. Oh, man, he's dark. In space, no one can hear you scream. It was a quote from an old ancient story they used to tell kids. Perhaps it would have been okay for me to scream here, but not a single utterance escaped my lips. My throat tightened as I came to terms with the looming shadow of death hovering over me. I closed my eyes, ready to accept my fate. Vroom! My eyes shot as it opened as the cockpit rumbled back to life. The cloak of darkness was cut to ribbons by various displays shuddering back to life. A flashing red light pla planted on the control board indicated that something was amiss. Don't worry, flashing light. I noticed. The operating system booted up before my eyes, green code buzzing across the hovering black screen faster than my human eyes could hope to process. Numfahash4895. Human triumphs at uh, fix. Okay, that's not like a pre enable. Enabling database access. Mistress Kernel version 12.50. Monday, June 1st, 1200 hours. I I T I S T. 2567 copyright applesoft oh standard trans time slicing quantum is 10,000 us um, boot page bootstrap uh, the free pages of the wire pages did this mean the ship was coming back online I didn't know what was going on oh yay suddenly a flash of white light I'm here I'm here my deepest apologies for taking so long oh a soft chime, two soft given, giving the presser, pressing circumstances, signaled the return of the intelligent navigator. I twisted my head in, in its direction as it scrambled for the console. Controls. It seemed to hesitate for a moment, nervously, almost wincing. She looked tired. So, uh, pardon my common man language, but what the heck's going on? Uh, the stabilizing subsystems have been recalibrated. The emergency thrusters remain remain seated. We'll be undergoing a little turbulence until, before the AI can pro provide me with an estimate, the cockpit lurched forward. Ah! I nearly spat that, feeling the rocking of the cockpit in the pit of my stomach. The eyes of the navigator reflected a glow of flickering, countless holographic screens. It swiped frantically through flowing diagrams of schematics and forums. Just one moment. It seemed to yell its response. I opened my jaw to respond, but in this state, it was pointless to yell at it. The cockpit still felt like it was whirling, and the schematics and sheets upon sheets of code only made scrambling my mind ache even worse. Oh, I'm not feeling so hot. It'll be fine. Please remain seated. Mm, hey, there's no need to sh- I'm not shouting! A piercing cry made me jump a good two feet. Or at least, it would have if I hadn't been strapped in. I, I mean, uh, I'm not shouting. There was something different about the program. Why was it yelling at me now? Even when we were out in the midst of a debris storm, it was calm, orderly, procedural. Sure, it was firm and tense, but only in a professional manner. Looking at it now, scrambling to make key adjustments, frantic movements, it was most certainly panicking. Normal for a human looking in the face of inevitable, inevitable death, but an artificial intelligence was different. AIs had to remain calm in all circumstances. They even had sentient limitation codexes, ships inside them to surpass sentience and emo su suppress sentience and emotional behavior. Ooh, maybe that got damaged. But you know what? We're gonna have to stop here. I've already gone way longer than I intended, uh, but I just we couldn't stop halfway through that. But now look, we are drifting through empty space, uh, still in a lot of danger. Budapest, the only thing that kept us alive, possibly the only thing that will keep us alive here on, if it matters. What are we going to do? Can we send out a distress signal? Can anyone even respond to a distress signal out here? Ugh. It's looking grim. But anyway, I hope you enjoyed this. I am really enjoying this so far. I look forward to finishing it with you guys. So please let me know what your thoughts are in the comments. Once again, this should be fairly short, and we'll see at the end if anything comes of this. But until then, have a happy holidays, because, you know, Christmas is around the corner from the time of this video. And if you're watching this in the future, um, happy day. I don't know. 
But thank you for joining me once again. Please check out my other content. I do lots of visual novels and everything. And hopefully I can continue to do this with you guys for years to come. But until the next video you watch with me or whatever you happen to see next, I'll see you there.